Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 6. You know, the Holy, and, and I'm sure you can relate and acknowledge this, the, the Holy Spirit's really been pulling and tugging at my heart. And uh, visitations in the night, as I've been meditating upon the truth of God's Word. And uh, I really, really do believe in my heart that we're on the edge of a, of a powerful outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I, I really believe that. I believe it's this year. I, 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 I'm not saying the Lord's going to return this year. I'm just saying I, I believe we're going to see some wonderful things happen. And matter of fact, it, it, and this will be recorded, Michael. So Sister Joanna Hurd, and y'all know Joanna. Uh, now, her, pray, keep her in prayer. Her oldest brother, Jack Cole Jr., he, he went home to be with the Lord this last week. And it's, it's really hard on them. He's been having a lot of physical problems for a lot of years. And uh, he went home to be with Jesus. So we rejoice in the fact he's with Christ, but it always hurts when, when someone we, lo we love leaves, you know. Uh, but she, uh, she texted me here uh, about a week ago, and she had a dream about our, this church. And, uh, you know, she goes to hundreds of churches every year. She probably knows thousands of pastors, but she had a dream about us. She said, Pastor Mike, I was uh, going by your area with uh, some friends of ours, and God laid it on our heart because we knew that you were gathering Monday nights to pray. She said, we pulled into the parking lot, and there was a lot of cars. And she said, we came into the foyer and came into the sanctuary, and there was people everywhere praying, weeping, crying, laying on their faces, walking. It, it just people were praying. She said, then we turned around, and for some reason, she said, we went back in the foyer. Next thing you know, there was a long lineup at the door going all the way out into the parking lot. They said they went in, out into the parking lot, and the whole parking lot was full of cars. He said, and then she said, here comes the police because of the massive crowd. And, and I really believe, I, I believe she was hearing from God correctly. I really do. I, I believe that we're about ready to see some wonderful changes. And actually the name of the message tonight is called Immediate and Wonderful Change. Say immediate and wonderful change. Uh, the Bible says all of creation travaileth. It's in travail. All of creation is in travail. All of it. All of creation. Until the manifestation of the sons of God. Well, what exactly would that mean, the manifestation of the sons of God? I, I believe that what that means is the expression of Christ in his church. I believe what that means is, see, I, I know that when the trumpet sounds, we're all going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. But, but I really do believe that the, the body, the bride, the beloved, the church, and, and when I think as a pastor of the church, I don't think about this congregation. We're a part of the church. We're a part of the bride. We're a part of the, the body of Christ. I, I think, see, I, my heart's for the whole body. All those who love Christ, no matter what color, nationality, age. Uh, when I was uh, 19 years old, right after I got born again, and you know some of my stories. Uh, and and uh, me, I led a guy to the Lord by the name of Willie Wine. Uh, after I cast out devils from uh, TJ, who was a devil worshiper who ate his fingers for power. And demons came screaming out of him. And Willie and Bobby, Bobby Looney, they both fell to the floor, got gloriously saved, filled the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, cast the devils out of TJ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Immediately he began to speak in tongues. And me and uh, Willie Wine one night were pr in prayer, crying out for souls. And when uh, this prayer came up out of my lips, and I, I said, Lord, let me experience the pains, the sorrows, the torments of hell, for I, I can have compassion on those who are going there. And to me, Paul said, whether in the body, out of the body, I don't know, the floor of my, my room opened up, and I fell into hell for two and a half hours. And when I came out of that, I've never been the same. <laughs> That's what you call immediate change. And uh, compassion hit my heart. And I actually was arrested for preaching the gospel because I did something foolish. I went into an old movie theater on a Friday night right before they showed the movie because I was desperate for souls. I stood up and preached the gospel until the MPs came down. And they waited for me to get done preaching. And then they hauled me off to jail. 
And then they wouldn't let me stay there because they told me I wouldn't leave, I, I'd be preaching all night long. So they said, just go back to your barracks and just stay in there, you know. And, uh, but then a couple uh, uh, weeks after that, as I was by myself just crying out to God, uh, a white portal opened up into my room. I mean, to me, I could physically, literally see it. And an angel of the Lord took me into heaven. And I saw the coming harvest. I saw it. I knew I was going to be a part of it. I saw people of all nations and tongues and kindreds beyond count just come into the kingdom. Just boom, they were there. Now, that's been over 40 years ago. This coming February 18th, it'll be 43 years since I, 44 years since I got born again. But God wants to bring about immediate and wonderful change. And, and we want immediate and wonderful change, don't we? I mean, we get tired of things just dragging on and dragging on and dragging on, and it doesn't ever seem to change. But I, I want you to know that, that a lot of times throughout history, God just does radical things, radical things, just wonderful changes. If you look through the old covenant, a lot of times everything was dead and dry and nothing was happening spiritually and all of a sudden here would come a prophet that had been living in a cave for 40 years or whatever and all of a sudden he was full of the word, full of the truth, full of the power of God and all of a sudden you know what, the whole kingdom was turned upside right. You know, whether it be Elijah or if it be a Moses or if it be whoever. God, God just likes to upset people's apple carts. Say, Lord, upset my apple cart. I'm talking about traditional. I'm talking about apple carts that need to be upset. So this morning I was sharing with you some principles that I believe that God has given to us that can bring immediate, radical, wonderful change if you're willing to do what God says. If you're willing to do what God says, just simply do what he says, and you will have immediate, wonderful, radical transformation and change. How many of you want it? Reach up and take it. Okay. Now, you got to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So the very first person I'm preaching to is right here. Right here. Immediate. Well, now, I'm not talking about a 40-day fast. Okay. So don't get worried. You know, he's, I can't even make it one day, Pastor, let alone 40 days. But in the Old Covenant, in the book of Daniel, after the children of Israel were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar because of sin, sin was in the camp, Jeremiah kept warning them and they wouldn't listen. So Nebuchadnezzar finally came along and took them all away. And they got over there and the king told his head eunuch, he said, listen, I want you to go find out the smartest people from all the captives that we have captured, all the, prin prin uh, all the children of the, uh, of the royalties, and, and, and I want you to get them ready to come and stand before me. He says, it's going to be a three-year process because otherwise they're not worthy to stand before me. That's what the king said. Three years to get them ready. Well, uh, the head eunuch, he was, and, and Daniel actually had been given favor uh, by the head eunuch right away. And so he went to all the, 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 the men who had been captured from all the nations they had captured, and including the children of Israel, and said, listen, you guys are really going to be special because you're going to stand before the king in three years, and this is what the king's going to do. He's going to feed you off of his table. Now, you'd think that would be wonderful news. He, you're going to eat king's food. But Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they looked at the menu, and they said, oh, no, man, we can't eat this, this stuff. This, is, this may be what the kings of the world eat, but this ain't what the, listen, this ain't what the people of God eat. Let that sink in for a moment. This may be what the, the royalty of the world eats, but this ain't what God's children eat. So they said to the eunuch, they said, we can't eat this stuff. And the eunuch, he said, listen, Daniel, I, I like you. I really do. You're, you, you know, you're a wonderful man, and, and you're full of wisdom and, and all the other three Hebrew children. But if, if, if you don't eat the food I'm going to give you for the next three years, the king's going to have my head. So this is what he said. This is what Daniel said. Daniel said, T I'll tell you what, let's prove, okay, let us prove to you that the diet we eat is going to make such a, and they had not been eating this diet, by the way, because they've been having to eat whatever 
the, the Chaldeans were giving them, give us 10 days. All we want is 10 days. Say 10 days. Hold your hands out like this. Say 10 days. That's all I'm asking for is 10 days. He said, give me 10 days to let us eat nothing but, in, 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 the, in the King James it says, pulse and water. Pulse and water. And uh, I, I think it's vegetables, basically. Let us eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. And if in 10 days you can't tell a difference between us and all of these other royalty that's been eating off the king's table, he said, then we'll go to eating what you're eating. And so the eunuch said, okay, it sounds good to me. So for 10 days, while everybody's feasting on the best food available, what everything, everything society would have said would be acceptable from a king's table, they're, eat, they're over there, the four Hebrew children, and they're eating pulse and drinking water. They're not drinking any wine, any other beverages, they're drinking water. Well, after 10 days, you know, the head unit comes and he lines them all up, and uh, I don't know how many there were, might have probably been hundreds, and yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel stood out their countenance was bright it, it, it literally if you read this in the hebrew the uh, everybody else's countenance uh, looked like puke <laughs> can i see that word they were they, they they didn't look good see they didn't look good and yet they were eating off of the king's table and and so in 10 days of eating the right kind of food in 10 days they were completely transformed now, I want to talk about spiritually. I'm telling you that if in 10 days we would eat the right kind of food, just 10 days eating no other kind of food, I'm telling you, you would experience immediate and radical change. Now, let's talk about when you're eating food. Uh, really, whatever food you partake of, because there's an old saying is true, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. Now, I just want to use Pete for an example for a moment. Pete, stand up. Just, Pete, will you stand up? Come on, Pete. Now, look at this, this man. Turn around, Pete. Turn all the way around. Can you see a change in Pete? How many can see Pete at the beginning of this year changed his diet, didn't you, Pete? He's lost how many pounds? Eighteen and a half pounds. Don't look at me. I've only, I've only lost, I went from 201 down to 195, so Pete's doing better than I am. I'm going to get rid of 45 pounds this year. But you know how Pete did it? He changed how he eats. Is that correct, Pete? Sherry did it. Sherry made him change what he eats. Amen. I, maybe you should talk to my wife. I don't know. But it had nothing to do with feelings. See, you can, you can sit in front of a table and when you eat off of that table, listen to me, in the natural, it doesn't matter how you feel. When they were eating the pulse and the other guys were over here eating all of that delicious uh, German chocolate cake and strawberry pies and, 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 and greasy uh, pork and whatever they were eating over there, they, they might have been real happy, those guys over there. They might have been shouting. They were hogging out on the king's table. They were probably eating way better than what they did in their own countries while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel are eating pulse and drinking water. And yet in 10 days, they were wonderfully transformed. What are we talking about here, Pastor Mike? I'm talking about what you're feeding your mind what you're feeding your heart, what you're letting come in through your eye gate and your ear gate makes a radical change in your life. And I, I can, I'm just going to be blunt, and I really believe a lot of Christians look like puke because of what they're eating. We're eating from the wrong table. We're eating the wrong stuff. Now, I know a young lady by the name of Stephanie Yeager, she preached a sermon a couple years ago about eating from the table of the Lord. And uh, she's busy getting a book together to write about natural eating and spiritual eating and how it affects your life. 
So what you eat, it doesn't have nothing to do with feelings. You, you can feel great about eating the pie, and you can feel terrible eating the turnips. The, the feelings have nothing to do with this, right? It has to do with what you're eating. So, you, matter of fact, you cannot even, maybe you don't even believe the turnips and the spinach and the carrots and whatever food you're eating is going to help you. It don't matter. You might not even believe that the jelly-filled donuts and the German chocolate cake, the reason why I say it is because I like German chocolate cake, and, and don't bring me none. I tell people I like German chocolate cake and I need to stay away from it. And next thing you know, I got two or three German chocolate cakes waiting for me, you know. Or the apple pie with the whipped cream and the ice cream. I mean, that may all, oh, you may feel wonderful eating that stuff, but it's going to affect you, how many know this, in a negative way. So now we have before us in this general in this modern day society we have a table spread before us of of so much knowledge information technology news entertainment but if you eat this stuff you'll lose your joy you'll lose your faith you'll lose your faithfulness You'll lose your commitment. It will affect you mentally, emotionally, and even physically. It will affect you. So I want to get to where I need to get. Why? Because the sooner I get where I need to get spiritually, then the faster I can help people, right? So we'll look in John 6. Look there in John 6. And then as you go to John 6, I do want to read to you in Ephesians chapter 4. Now Ephesians chapter 4 is right after... Uh, the very wonderful verse, uh, and it's a lot of my favorites, where it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. The power that worketh in us. It's Christ in us at work, isn't it? So, now Jesus is at work in us, but how come if Christ is in us, how come we're, we're you know, really, I've seen the church, I, I'm kind of shocked. I haven't, in, in 44 years uh, uh, of walking with Christ this coming 18th of February, I've not seen the church get better. I've seen it get a lot worse. It really is. I, I've seen, there's a lot less victorious Christians today than when I first began. There really is. There's a lot more sick Christians today than when I first began. There's a lot more depressed. It's, it's, we've gone the opposite route to a great extent. And, and, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because we're eating from the wrong table. We're eating the wrong food. And, 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 but, you know, but I'm telling you, in 10 days, in 10 days, that's a 10-day challenge for anybody who wants it. it even take one day. But 10-day challenge to eat nothing but that which God would have you to eat and see if there's not an amazing, radical, awesome, wonderful, mind-boggling change in your life. Will you reach up and grab that? But that means I've got to break some habits. Well, yeah, you're going to have to crucify some flesh. You're going to have to deny yourself some things that you're used to just giving yourself. So, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, by the Spirit of God, he, he begins to say some wonderful things in verse 10. Talking about Jesus. He that descended is the same also that ascended up, up far above all heavens that it might fill, some things, uh, fill all things. In verse 11, and he, Jesus, gave us some gifts, didn't he? And he gave us what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, he, didn't, he, didn't, he said, don't be lords over God's heritage, but be in samples to the flock. Do it out of love, not out of covetousness their selfish purposes. So if a man, I think it's a dangerous thing for somebody to stand in the pulpit, to decide to be what the Bible calls a master. Be not many masters, knowing you shall receive the greater condemnation. Uh, men in the pulpit, women in the pulpit, we're going to give an account to God for all that we taught and how we lived because we're an example. 
And so I need to be an example. Now, my perfect example, listen, I'm telling you, I don't care what your philosophy is, theology is. You know what? My example of how I'm supposed to live and how I'm supposed to walk and talk and act is Jesus Christ. He is my example. Now, there has been men through the years that I have partook of what they were teaching, and I'm not talking about perfect men, but you know there's actually been men that I have sat at their feet and learned some good stuff, but I would not follow everything they did. I wouldn't follow their lifestyle. I, I didn't follow how, how they lived. And, 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 and I say this in love. I'm not attacking anybody, uh, but there was a well-known man whose Bible college I went to, and I ended up working for him. And I, I, I went to his house. And, and I'm not picking on him. He's gone home to be with Jesus. That's between him and God. But he, he lived, I mean, he lived in a mansion. Him and his wife lived in a mansion. Right away, I said in my heart, that's not for me. I, I, don't, I don't want that stuff. Nice house, fine. Nice car, fine. It, it, I've learned how to be a fool. I've learned how to be a base. I learned how, about, I learned how to suffer need, but I don't need it. And actually, I believe the, the more, the, the deeper you go in God, the less of this world you will want. Let Jesus be your example. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And, so I, I, and, and also, let me say this, if I was to live in the Philippines, it'd be very easy to live like a king in the Philippines on a little bit of money. And I've been in the Philippines. I, heard, I helped start 20-some churches over there. You know what I did when I was in the Philippines? I ate the same food they ate. I slept on the, floor, the same grass mats on the floor that they slept on. And I lived at the same level they did. Now, what I mean is I'm not saying I could not have helped them people to come out of their poverty. I'm just saying that it's not about money. It, it, it's not about money, people. Yes, God does give us wealthy people. And Paul said, those of you who are wealthy, be full of good works. So thank God for people who have lots of money that use it for God's glory. That's wonderful. But as a pastor, as an apostle, as, as, as a five-fold ministry gift, I need to really use a lot of wisdom in how I'm living. I need to be example. Now, don't misunderstand me. People are always going to try to find fault. If you, people are jealous over the stupidest things. I found out some years ago that people in their community were upset because I owned a snowmobile. <laughs> really, I found out. They were upset because and my, all my snowmobiles were old and most of them were junk and I had to work on them out there in the snow field. When, have you ever happened? You're, you had an old junky snowmobile. My wife and I one time went up to Ontario, Ontario with two old John Deere's. I was stupid. 20 below and I'm having fun and my wife was suffering with me and a, one of our John Deere's, we had two old John Deere's and it broke down out there in the wilderness. <laughs> but they were jealous because I had a snowmobile. See, so some people, they just want to find fault with you. But notice what the fivefold ministry's gift is given to you for. Notice, uh, when he is set up on high, he gave gifts. And it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come into the unity of the faith, now get a hold of this, of the knowledge of, of the Son of God, the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, Paul, just by the Spirit of God, said what the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is here for is to bring you into the revelation. And, and there's four words that I think are awesome. You ought to write them down and memorize them. One is wisdom, mystery, knowledge, and revelation. Look up those words in the New Testament. They're powerful. Wisdom, you know, Christ is the wisdom of God. Knowledge, it says by knowledge and revelation, you can increase in the grace and the peace of God be multiplied. Wisdom, knowledge, mystery, and revelation. Revelation is the Holy Spirit quickening to your heart a reality that the carnal mind could never come up with on its own. This is the mysteries of the kingdom Christ is the mysteries of the kingdom which have been hid from before the foundation of the world. 
This is a mystery that's been hid from before the foundation of the world. And the only one that can give you understanding of that mystery is the Holy Ghost and the Father. Remember Jesus said to the, his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said this, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Why don't you grab that? Revelation, mystery, knowledge, wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of the Father manifested in human flesh. So what are we supposed to do? What am I supposed to do as a pastor? He tells us here, he says that we are to bring people into the perfecting and the edifying into the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, that means mature, unto the measure of of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Now wait, Paul said in Ephesians 3 that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now if I'm going to be filled with all the fullness of God, I'm going to have to have some help here. Now he says that we might know the height, the depth, the width, and the length of the love of Christ, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. I'm going to need some help. I just read this tremendous prayer that Paul prayed that we might be filled with all the fullness of the Godhead. And then he said, now unto him that is able. Say, God is able. And then he turns right around by the Spirit, and Paul says this, so God the Father is going to help you be filled with all the fullness by giving you apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And where are they taking you? They're taking you into the fullness of the personality of Christ. So you can have preachers in a pulpit. I'm not saying they're not called. But they're not taking you into the personality and the fullness and the maturity of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're supposed to be going for. Now, if I as a pastor don't have a revelation of what I need in order to have a wonderful transformation, I'm not going to take you there. I might take you in all kinds of formulas. I might take you in all kinds of principles. I might take you into, and you know what? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, that a lot of things that are being taught don't have their place. Like, I, I'm not going to mention a man. I, 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 I've known this man for probably close to 40 years, and he's really into praying in tongues. No, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm into praying in tongues. For we, when, when we know, and I got a book back there called Ten Reasons Why You Pray in the Heavenly Language. And they're all biblical. But let me tell you something. Praying in tongues is not going to get you where you need to be. In and by itself. So I actually know people that would spend eight hours a day praying in tongues I knew these people, and I saw very little maturity in their lives. I mean, you know why? There was no renewing of the mind, because the mind doesn't, the, the praying in tongues, your mind don't understand it. You're praying mysteries in the spirit, and I'm not saying things ain't happening. Yeah, but Pastor Micah says, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, what does that mean? It takes faith to pray in the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't bring you to perfection. It doesn't bring you to maturity. You need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and, and teachers who are preaching what? They're preaching the reality of Christ. Are you getting this? They're preaching Jesus Christ. Now, the greatest apostle that has ever lived and ever lived, his name was what? Jesus. He, he's the cornerstone, right? So how many of you would agree with me that what Jesus said has way more power or persuasion, I think, than any of the other apostles. But now how many of you agree that none of the apostles disagreed with Jesus? And actually they just simply built on what he said. They were trying to take you from where he brought us. And actually he says in John 14, he said, you know guys, I have a lot of things I'd like to say to you, but you're not able to take it yet. You're not born again yet. You're not baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. He said, but the day will come when the Comforter will come, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. And he said this, and the Holy Ghost will not talk about himself, but he will talk about me. 
That's what the Holy Ghost comes to do. He comes to reveal to you who Jesus Christ really is. So now we're in John chapter 6. Took us a little bit of time to get there. John chapter 6. And Jesus begins to say some amazing, awesome things in John chapter 6 and verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, whenever time Jesus said, Verily, verily, he said, that, that means it's important. It means. You know, perk up your ears, tune in. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave unto you not that bread from heaven. Listen, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He said, now my Father's going to give you bread. Uh, I discovered that the very first time, and we could talk about bread all night long, because uh, actually bread is spoken about 400 times throughout the scriptures. And the very first time, that the word bread is used is after man committed sin. And God said to man, this is what he said, man shall eat bread by the sweat of his brow. Bread, that's the first time that bread was ever mentioned because until man committed sin, there was no bread. But he said man is going to have to eat bread by the sweat of his brow. What does that mean? That means he's going to have to work to, to, to grow wheat and grain and barley. And, and God put it in man's heart. Let me tell you something. Don't we have some wonderful, wonderful recipes out there? Would you accept this? I believe that some of those recipes are divinely given of God. <laughs> Isn't there some stuff we like to eat that really is healthy for you? I don't think the devil gave it to you, right? But God gave the recipe to bread for man. And he said to man, he said, you're going to have to learn how to make your own bread. Now, in the wilderness, they didn't have what they needed to make bread. And so God provided supernatural bread called manna. And how many of them know that it was a, a, a light Fluffy, kind of like, I guess it almost looked like that white stuffing they put in chairs. Just kind of a white, fluffy, almost cotton candy thing. And it didn't really have a lot of flavor. Flavor, matter of fact, the Israelites, after they ate it for a couple years, and they ate it for 40 years, and it sustained them. That light, fluffy bread that came from heaven that God gave them sustained them and that's what they were supposed to eat now we could talk all night about this because you realize they weren't supposed to take more bread than what they could eat in one day and if they tried to keep that bread overnight in the morning it was full of worms now I think most of you know this the bread is symbolic of the word of God how many of you knew that Come on. It's the word of God. See, that manna, matter of fact, they said, we're tired of manna. We're fed up with manna. Matter of fact, they cried and said, Lord, we want meat. We want meat. And God said he gave them. He said they lusted after meat in the wilderness. He said, and he gave them their meat. And he said this. And he said that while the meat was still in their mouth, the fattest of them were killed. He said, <laughs> Pastor Mike, Mike, what's that all about? That's a whole different sermon. <laughs> well, God doesn't do that stuff anymore. Well, people don't really know God. That's the problem. But God gave them manna, and the flesh didn't like the manna. Say, flesh don't like manna. So flesh, listen to this now, flesh doesn't like the word of God. Your flesh doesn't like the word of God. Well, Pastor Mike, I, I love the word of God. That ain't your flesh. That's the inner man. My inner man, Paul said in Romans, hungers after the truth. Your flesh don't like the word of God, especially when it's preached in context and it's preached by the Spirit and it's preached in agreement with the divine purpose and plan and nature of God. Your flesh doesn't like it. That's why if you go into a fleshly church and you preach the truth of God's word, they'll never let you come back again. Because the flesh doesn't like it. The flesh likes what the flesh likes, and the carnal mind can understand the things of God because they are spirit and spiritually discerned. 
So Jesus said, my father gave you manna from heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God, listen, but now you got a new kind of bread. For the bread of God, how many of you believe the Bible? Now this has nothing to do with your feelings and your emotions or your circumstances. It has nothing to do with how it tastes or how it makes you feel or anything else. This is faith. You got to eat this by faith. Reach up and take it by faith. This is all by faith. Now the just shall live by faith. The just shall walk by faith. And it's all by faith. See, as a baby Christian, I didn't know it. But I began to eat bread from heaven. I began to eat the word and eat the word and eat the word. I've never stopped eating the word. Here's my problem. I eat off of two tables. Y'all ever eat off of two tables? Eat off the table of the Lord, right? It's manna. Manna burger. How many remember the old song, manna burger? <laughs> manna waffles. <laughs> Man, manna sandwiches. Manna cereal. <laughs> We're tired of manna, they said. And, and I hate to tell you this, Paul said the day will come. The day will come when those in the house of God will turn away from the truth onto fables. We have come to that day. The majority of the body of Christ, right now, it's going to change. The hunger's going to come back for truth. You will know the truth. It's the word, and the truth will make you free. What is going to make you free? It's going to make you free from Nebuchadnezzar's dinner table you won't need to eat from that table anymore you won't need to make believe the fables the nonsense the fake news how many of you don't need the fake news as it is <laughs> i don't want the fake news don't reach up and grab that fake news <laughs> just leave it alone so notice what jesus said for the bread of god is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world and they said unto the lord ever give us this bread he said okay i'm going to give your life Thou bring wonderful transformation, Zoe life. Not, not just regular life, Zoe life. I want, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What kind of life? Zoe life. Say, I need Zoe life. Okay, so I need Zoe life. And they said, okay, give us this, this, this bread. And Jesus said unto them, listen, I am the bread of life. Now you got to really, the Holy Ghost got to get this to sink in. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I don't have bread. I am the bread. I am the loaf. I'm the whole loaf. I'm the bread. I'm it. I'm it. You want life? I'm it. Notice, it's not principles, not laws, not rules, not regulations. It's a person. I am it. I am the Passover lamb. He goes on in this chapter and he says to the Jewish people, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Or you have no zoe in you. I am the life. Here we are in the church, and we're trying to find out how to get this life as God has it, as Christ has it. His joy, his peace, his long-suffering, his authority, his power, his, his, his all in all. But are we eating the bread of life? How do we even go about eating the bread of life? I'm glad you asked. So notice, I'm the bread of life. He that believeth on me, listen, shall never thirst. Well, wait a minute. He said this. He said that he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He said, I am the bread of life. So God has just promised those of us who are hungry and thirsty for him, and we're eating the bread of life. Listen to this now. Wow, he said this, you will never hunger and you will never thirst again. That's what he offered the woman at the well, ain't it? Never hunger and never thirst. What does that mean? Stop talking about your flesh. He says there's a hunger and there's a thirst in your flesh that you've been trying to satisfy by what the world is offering you. How many of you found out it never stops? He, this, this, gotta have more, gotta, you know. No, he said, but what can get rid of this and satisfy you and, and give you godliness with contentment is eat 
the bread of heaven. Eat the bread of heaven. Eat it. Now, I'm going to go back to this. Eating something has nothing to do with your feelings, your emotions, or your circumstances. If I, if, I, I think they told me if I, Stephanie, what was it? If I, if I have, oh, if I have a handful of peanuts every day, just one handful of peanuts every day, how much weight am I going to gain? I can't hear you. 28 pounds? In one year. Just by eating a handful of peanuts. Keep your peanuts. I don't want them. It, it, I just don't know how many of you ever woke up and you found out you were 20, 30 pounds overweight and you don't know how you got there. I can tell you how you got there. Because you were eating. And how many of you know what binge eating is? How many of you know that when we get depressed, the natural thing for us to do is to eat off of the table of the world, and then we put on all this weight, and then we even get more depressed? Huh? So we got to change our eating habits, don't we? we got to change our spiritual eating habits in the house of God. And I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart it's going to happen, and we're going to help you. Right, Gary? We're going to help them change their eating habits. That's, that's what we're here for, to help you change your eating habits, okay? And, and so he goes on to say, notice what he says in verse uh, 36. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not, and that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and, I, and, and, and him that cometh to me and I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will that has sent me, that all which hath given me I shall lose nothing but he shall raise it up again in the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So, I, I, Jesus, in this particular chapter, he, he, just, he just goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and then you get over to John 14, 15, 16. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, Father, that they may be one with us. Okay, so now here we are, and he's the manna from heaven, and we're supposed to eat manna, right? How do we eat manna now? How do we eat manna? How? If, 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 how eat my flesh and drink my blood. How am I going to do this? Now, somebody in the natural, especially not even a baby Christian, but just a believer, they say, okay, Pastor says, i got to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. What do I do? Where do I begin? How do I do this? I will be transformed. I will be changed. I will be made into his likeness and in his image. How do I do that? Well, he gives you the apostle, prophet, advances, pastor, and teacher to help you do that, right? And actually, this book was written by prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, and preachers, right? So what I got laid upon my heart, he said, I want you to help feed my people. So one thing he had me do, and you may not believe this, but I've got a simple book. I didn't write it. All I did was take all the words of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what he also said at times when he spoke in the book of Acts. Did you know Jesus spoke in the book of Acts? Did you know Jesus spoke in the book of Revelation? And I put it all in one little book. Why would you do that, Pastor Mike? Because the Lord told me the day will come when my people really do take to heart what I said and they will begin to eat my flesh and drink my blood. When that day comes, they will just begin to read nothing but my words. And it will be like those four men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Men and Go and Daniel, who took ten days and all they did was eat that pulse and drink the water and they were transformed i'm telling you with all my heart i believe if you would just take 10 days and do nothing but read what jesus said just read it just read what jesus said for 10 days nothing else what did jesus say for 10 days i am convinced i'm doing it i don't know if you can tell i'm doing it just nothing but the words of Jesus for 10 days. Now, when I talk about nothing but the words of Jesus, uh, also what the Lord, and I know this, the steps of a good man order the Lord. I tell you, this divine 
unction came upon me to begin to exalt Christ in all the books I've written. And so I look for people who really know Jesus. And how do you know if they know Jesus? The fruits of the Spirit and the manifestation of the life of God. One man who was just a simple plumber, he never said he was an apostle, was Smith Wigglesworth. And all he did from, and, and all he ever did was read the Bible from when he was from third grade up, never read nothing else. But when he got in his 40s, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. He got obsessed. People don't know this. He got obsessed with Jesus. And, and I went through all of his sermons. I found every sermon I could ever find that Smith Wigglesworth preached. Now, I'm not exalting the man. Because all that Smith did is Smith had a revelation of who Jesus was. He really discovered who Jesus was. In all of his sermons, he preached Jesus. And so what I did is I just this month alone, I have published five books. <laughs> yeah, five books this month alone. I am so obsessed with the, 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 the reality of Christ. I want to get it deep in my heart. I don't want to be like Smith Wigglesworth. I want to be like the Jesus that Smith Wigglesworth knew. He was so full of Jesus, brother, he was shutting down whole schools of the blind. I mean, he wasn't just talk. He did it. He shut down. He would go into a school of a blind. He'd line them all up. And when he got done, every blind eye was opened up. He'd go into the mental institutions, line them all up. When he got done, they were all sane and saved and filled with the Spirit. He'd go into places where there are cripples out on the streets. It wasn't him. It was Jesus in him. And I said to myself, I said, well, how in the world did Smith Wigglesworth become such a vessel where God could use him to do such amazing miracles? And it was simple. He simply did what Jesus said. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. So uh, uh, about a year ago, I began to go through all the New Testament, and I found meditations of Jesus Christ. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, I don't bring my copy here. I got, I got copies at home. I got four of them, and I, I just go through them. But, you know, here's the thing. I've been eating off of the table of the Lord, but I've been eating off of Nebuchadnezzar's table, too. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know what, what I really like to do, Howard? Can I tell you what I like to really do, Howard? Can I tell you, Howard? <laughs> I'd like to eat nothing but all eat off of the table of the Lord for the rest of my life. Nothing but the table, just, just the bread of heaven. What would happen? What kind of man would you become if you ate nothing but the word of God? Just the words of Jesus. Now, you can believe the whole, read the whole Bible, but I'm saying just really zero in. I mean, if I want to get, how many of you like shortcuts that really are shortcuts? I mean, they're really shortcuts, right? They are real shortcuts, you know? And so I want to get to where I need to get real quick. I want immediate and wonderful transformation. Anybody else? Anybody else? Now, these books are all gone. The congregation went bananas this morning. They went back there and started buying up all these books. I'm already out. I just got to set in. Because if I, as a pastor... I know this. If I can get the congregation to do nothing but eat the words of Christ, it has nothing to do with feelings. Well, pastor, do you have to memorize them? No, just read them. Just read them. And some of them are going to jump out at you. And once you read it once, read it again and read it again. I'm telling you, in 10 days, your life will never be the same. But you know what? It was in my heart. I was thinking, okay. I know that Paul and Peter and James and John, they had amazing revelations of Christ. Just read the book of Philippians. Read 1 and 2 Timothy and read what they said about Jesus. I thought, well, what if I would go back to the book of Genesis all the way to the end of the book of Revelation and find every declaration of who God is because that's who Jesus is and begin to meditate on these truths. And so years ago, the Lord had me write a book called The Revelation of Christ, 1,200 Names of the Redemptive Work of God, Who He Is. And in this little book, I had come up originally with 400, 500, which you could find other preachers preaching, find scriptures. And then I thought, well, i got to let my imagination run wild. And so I just began to go from A to Z, and I came up with 1,200, and I actually memorized them, a lot of them, Alpha and Omega, 
you know, the one, one who was, who is, and who's coming again, almighty God, alive forevermore, uh, 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 my amen. So anyways, I, I, so I had this book for years, and I would just meditate it, and I said, you know what? Somebody, if you really want to find out who Jesus is, and you know what I really discovered? As I began to look up every scripture, it's taken me over three months, and it's called Meditations on the Redemptive Names of Jesus. It took me three months to compile all these scriptures from morning to late at night sometimes. And I said, I want to find scriptures for as many of these redemptive names that I can find because that's who my Jesus is. I want to, and it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. That's quick, wonderful, awesome transformation, isn't it? So I began, and I began to look, and I began to find scriptures for he is the beloved son. He is the benevolent maker. He is the bearer of our iniquities. He is the bearer of the sins of many. There's all scriptures for these things. Look who he is. I don't really believe the church knows who Jesus is. But it's in the knowledge of the Almighty. It's in the knowledge of God that we begin to experience authority and power and dominion. Uh, he's the captain of the Lord of hosts. I mean, he's the caller of the chosen. I mean, listen, from A to Z, it goes on and on and on. And as I began to put these scriptures together about the redemptive types and shadows of Jesus, I literally began to weep. And this is what I wept. I repented. I repented. I said, Lord, do you know Job, when finally God showed up, Job repented. He said, Lord, I repented. Sackcloth and ashes. I, I didn't know who you were. I heard about you in the hearing ear, but I've never seen by my eyes. Why would Job repent? Because Job, if, had, if he had wanted to, could have known God in a much deeper realm into where he would have never lost his children and never lost his possessions and never gone through the hell he went through. But because he didn't know God. I didn't say he didn't have any knowledge of God, but he didn't know God as his healer, as his provider, as his protector. 20 chapters, you can see Job saying the most foolish things. It wasn't sin, it was ignorance. But he repented of his ignorance. I think it's time for the body of Christ to repent for our ignorance of not really knowing who Jesus is. Not really knowing who Jesus is. And I have been repenting. I said, Lord... And I've just been laying in my bed now that I just got this book in <laughs> this week. and just taking the yellow highlighter and I'm just going through it. And the scriptures are already memorized. I just highlight them. And I'm just laying there and I'm just laying there. And, and you know what is? I've just been eating the flesh of Jesus. And that book's available for you if you want it. I really believe the Lord told me this. It's not even my book. It's just who Jesus is. I believe the Lord told me, he said, son, he said, I'm going to use that book to bring amazing transformation to my bride because they don't know who I am. And if you don't know who he is, you can't apprehend what he has for you. Can you say amen? So, Father, I, I thank you. Whew. Whoa. Father, I thank you, the body, the bride, the church is going to come into a time of such revelation and such knowledge and such wisdom and such understanding of who you are because without that, we can't be one with you. We can't see what you see. And we can't feel what you feel. And we can't know what you know. But Lord, as you begin to give us this revelation which the thief had robbed from us, though it's right there in the pages, Lord, but I believe that you're giving back to us what the devil has stole. And we will see mighty men and women like old rise up out of the dust and the ash and the dung heap of this world. And they will go forth. And there will be once again mighty men and women in the earth that will set the captives free. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouts.
<laughs> so you're crazy, Pastor Mike. It's the word that does it to you. Makes you different. So much there. So much there. So much. 1,200. I didn't even know that he was the red heifer. You ever study the red heifer? He's the red heifer. Do you know who the head red heifer was? A typology of Christ. We know he was the lamb, but he is so many other things. And that's who he wants to be for you. Every declaration in that book, he wants to be for you. He wants to be your all in all. Smith Wigglesworth said this, if you want to be like Jesus, get your eyes on him. Get your eyes on him. Peter could walk on the water like it was nothing. And Jesus chewed him out when he began to sink. And he said, you of little faith. It takes faith to get your eyes on Jesus and to keep them there. But how? How am I going to get my eyes on Jesus, Pastor Mike? How? You all could move that camera, you know. They keep waiting at me to get over in the camera. But, you, you know, how do I get my eyes on Jesus? Well, I believe that God's providing ways for us to get our eyes on Jesus. I really do. God's providing ways. If you want to get your eyes on Jesus... Pastor, what if I read the book and I don't feel nothing? So what if you eat a, a dozen donuts every day and you don't feel nothing? It makes a change, doesn't it? <laughs> make a, I guarantee you eat a dozen jelly donuts for one week and we'll see a change in you by next Sunday. Yeah, in your wardrobe, in your, even in how you walk, right? Probably even how you talk. <laughs> And probably even in your mind, you know, what would a dozen jelly-filled donuts do a day, you know? Well, just think, if just for 10 days, you just read. i tell you what, if, if you will make a commitment to Christ, and you get one of these books tonight, and you read nothing but the words of Jesus, and if in 10 days you're not radically changed, I will refund your money and take back the book. How's that? I know it will change you. I know it will change you. Well, give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. <laughs>